Good morning, everybody. It's Sunday, January 17th, and this is The Journey Online. I have a few announcements for you this morning. First of all, we're going to be online indefinitely. We're taking it week to week, and so hopefully you read the email that Chris sent out last week. We're just kind of you know, looking at all the variables every week and seeing if now's the time. And so we feel like right now is not yet the time with the facility that we have and the amount of people that we have, but hopefully really soon. I want to get back to meeting together physically, and hopefully we can do that really soon at the Shrine Club, but we'll keep you guys uh, as updated as we possibly can. Another question we've had is, are we doing our yearly Uh, Men's prayer night, usually the last weekend in January, we get all the men together and have an all-night prayer. Well, we're not going to do it yet, so we're going to postpone it. Likely, we're going to do it this summer, so we're pushing it back. We're not going to be doing it in January this year, so likely this summer, so we'll keep you updated on that as well. You know, all these decisions are just really hard to make. Uh, I I feel like we have decision fatigue fatigue right now. Uh, just always trying to think of, uh, of what the variables are and what we should do, and it's, it's exhausting. I was, uh, I was meeting with a bunch of pastors throughout the Midwest in Acts 29 on a Zoom chat earlier this week, and we were all trying to encourage one another and think of ways we can encourage other pastors in the, in the Midwest. And one guy just put it, put it bluntly, and he put it great in a way that I could really relate. He said, I feel like every decision I make right now is a bad decision. So I'm in a constant state of trying to make the least bad decision I possibly can. <laughs> I was like, man, that nails it right there. We're, we're trying to make the least bad decision possible as we continue on. But you know what? Like I said last week, we, we feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I feel like we're getting close to, you know, we're over the hump. Things are going to gradually get better and better this year, and I can't wait to see you face-to-face. But you know what? Until then, let's just stay on track here in the book of Hebrews. We're, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to take verses 18 through 24. So grab your Bibles, get your coffee, and let's have a great study today. every week when I craft a sermon, one of the major concerns that I have is how can I, how can I encourage this congregation? How can I encourage listeners in their walk with Christ? And so uh, pastoral teaching and preaching, you know, it's, it's not just about lecturing information into your brain. I want to uh, hopefully present the text in such a way that you are motivated, encouraged, inspired to to keep keep going in your faith don't give up on faith don't don't lose hope keep repenting keep praying don't stop learning don't stop investing your time and energy into the kingdom of god because this this god honoring path it leads us somewhere it takes us into an an eternal destiny beyond what we could possibly imagine so the stakes are so so high And so this is the type of motivating message that we're reading in Hebrews chapter 12. And so encouragement is like served up on a silver platter today for us here in verses 18 through 24. So prepare to be encouraged. That's what we're studying today is encouragement. But all all, all these details about Jesus, about who he is and what he's accomplished, it's brought us to this point in the letter that that, that he wants to speak to us, hey, you have arrived and you are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that's going to come up in the text next week. But matter of fact, if you you look at the the paragraph we're getting ready to study, maybe the, the title is A Kingdom That Cannot Be Shaken. That's the title of this section of scripture in my in my book. But even that title is encouraging. We are a part of a kingdom that cannot fail. That We are citizens of this kingdom. And so every kingdom we've ever studied in human history has failed. You know, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall and nothing lasts forever here, right? And even in the context of the letter of Hebrews, it's written under the reign of Rome. And, and it was inconceivable to even think of a kingdom like Rome not dominating the world forever. Uh, but, you know, Rome wasn't conquered in a day, but uh, Rome ain't the same, right? <laughs> but so we are learning here that we are a part of a kingdom. We are citizens of a kingdom that cannot fail because it's rooted in heavenly realities. And that's a, that's a very common theme 
in the book of Hebrews, right? I mean, he's used this tactic before to teach us about faith. Like our faith is rooted in, in heavenly realities, not earthly realities. We have types and shadows of, of, of these heavenly realities here on earth, but not the real thing. And so we don't put our faith in any priest. We don't put our faith in any sacrifice or offering or, or temple ritual that could be carried out in order to be right with God. And Hebrews is really blunt about that. I mean, I think of uh, chapter 10, verse 4, where he says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Like, come on, man, what do you, that's not going to take away your sins. That's a type, that's a shadow to, to teach us about a heavenly reality, what we have in Christ. So our faith, right, is in the true things, as it says in, in Hebrews. And what the book of Hebrews means by the true things is it, it's, it's what's in heaven itself. Jesus is in heaven itself, and there he is our our high priest in the temple not made with hands, right? It's the true temple of God. And he's there interceding in such a way that he is, he is putting away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it says there in chapter 9. And this one sacrifice is for all time. It's entirely sufficient. He says in chapter 10, when, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And he goes on to teach us in chapter 10 that that single offering he has perf- with that single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so we have faith because of the true things, because of these heavenly realities. That's why our faith should be unshakable. That's why we can have assurance in what we believe. It's because it's rooted not in earthly realities but in heavenly realities. Well, that's, that's the tactic that is being used in the passage we're going to study today. We are citizens of this kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. It cannot fail. It's because we're a part of a kingdom that transcends what we can see here on this earth. And so this passage is meant to be a breath of fresh air today. It's meant to be a, a breath of fresh air to encourage you. And maybe you're thinking like, man, I could use some fresh air today. I'm not feeling uh, so great as a Christian right now. Maybe you're feeling a little, a little weary or a little frustrated. Maybe this walk with Christ is feeling a little heavy, a little burdensome as you try to, try to live it out. Well, this, this passage is meant to, to calm you down and to give you a breath of fresh air and encourage you. So first off, to understand it rightly, remember, let's think about the original audience. The original target audience was or were these Jewish Christian converts. And so they, they were ethnically Jews, they, they grew up in Jewish culture, and they had embraced Jesus as this foretold Messiah. And so they had converted, in a sense, to Christianity. So, but they lived in a context, though, where not all Jews felt that way. And so there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of strife, a lot of struggle, and, and a lot of Jews were really upset that people were seeing Jesus as this prophesied Messiah. So if you were a Jew reading this letter, you, you were feeling kind of shaky. You know, you, you were feeling, you know, this was all feeling very new. You lacked assurance. You were, you were maybe insecure about what you believed. You weren't confident. I think a lot of these Jews were just worried, man, am I just being a bad Jew not every Jew believes this. What, what do I do? And so here comes the book of Hebrews as a breath of fresh air to give them confidence. And, and the way that he's doing this is he's talking about something old and familiar to a Jew so that he can teach them something new about Jesus. So it's a, there's a compare and contrast that's going on in this passage of scripture. And here's, here's what we're comparing and contrasting. The old and new. The old is represented by Mount Sinai, and the new is Mount Zion. So we got these two mountains that we're gonna talk about. One is something they're very familiar with, but they're, they're familiar with the new too, but we're gonna learn some new things about what this means to be a citizen of this kingdom of God in Christ. So let's, let's learn about this first mountain. In, in verses 18 through 21. So grab your Bibles and we'll read it. In verse 18, it starts by saying, For you have not come to what may be touched, uh, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. 
Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So here's this first mountain being described, and it's important to remember this first mountain is one that we have not come to in our faith in Christ. And, and, and that's a relief because this, the image that comes to mind as we read that text, it's a scary scene, right? This mountain is intimidating, but it is one that may be touched because you can go there. This is Mount Sinai. This is clearly a description of Moses at Mount, at Mount Sinai. So when we re read this description, and now it does mention uh, Moses explicitly, but those details don't immediately trigger that scene, probably because we didn't grow up in all of the Jewish rituals and traditions. And so in, in our culture, like we know, er like everybody knows about the birth of Jesus, right? I could just mention details from the birth of Jesus and immediately everyone would know what I'm talking about. I could talk about shepherds and the Magi and Bethlehem and a manger. Oh, well, yeah, we know that that's the birth of Jesus. That's what's happening when you mix those ingredients together, right? Well, these Jews, they were familiar with Moses and Mount Sinai just like we are familiar with the birth of Jesus. And so when you would read to a Jew about a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. They'd say, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. That, that, I immediately know what you're talking about. That's an old familiar passage in, in, in the book of Exodus. I, I would have grown up hearing about that every single year. That's 100% Mount Sinai. So now you can go do your homework, right? Every, every week, I'm, I always encourage you to go brush up on these Old Testament references on your own. And if you want to do that, you can go read in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 19, and in, in Exodus 20 as well. You can also go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. But here's what's happening in that description. This is, this is a, a known theophany at Mount Sinai. This is just before Moses would have received the Ten Commandments. Now, I use the word theophany there. There's your $5 theological term for the day. A theophany, that's just a, a theological term that references any, any physical manifestation of God or that represents God in the Old Testament. So a burning bush, God speaking to Moses in a burning bush, well, that burning bush is not God, but that's, that's a theophany. God's voice came from that burning bush, and so God is communicating to his people through that means. And so this is the theophany, this Mount Sinai, this, this description is the theophany at Mount Sinai. And it's a very intimidating uh, scene, a very intense moment in the book of Exodus. So Moses was bringing his people, he let, he let, them out of, let God's people out of slavery. They had wandered in the wilderness some, and there they ended up at Mount Sinai. And they were getting ready to meet with God there. They were being consecrated. And so they were preparing for a few days leading up to this moment in which they were going to go to the foot of Mount Sinai and engage with their creator. And so what they did was they went through these cleansing rituals. They would put on brand new garments. Even the guys, here, a, a quick detail, even the guys weren't even allowed to sleep with their wives, if you know what I mean, uh, because all of the attention was to be on this coming meeting with God there at the foot of Mount Sinai. And so when they get there to engage with God, what happens is this frightening moment with a blazing fire, as it says, darkness and gloom and a tempest that's like a storm and so the storm covered the top of the the mountain and there was a fire there the the top of mount Fi uh, mount sinai was on fire and so there was lightning and thunder chaos then it says there was the this deafening sound of a trumpet that was getting louder and louder now were there literally trumpets being blown there, or was this describing something more supernatural that was taking place? Well, that's the kind of thing that scholars love to debate and talk about, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure. You can go read about those debates. Uh, I'm leaning towards something more uh, supernatural than literal trumpets being blown, but hey, we're, we're also given the description of this moment with smoke and fire. Obviously, the top of Mount Sinai, it's a blazing fire. Later, God is described as a consuming fire in, in this chapter. 
but that smoke is there with the storm and the clouds. It says, when you go back in Exodus, that the whole mountain trembled greatly. There was like an earthquake. The, the ground is moving. And, and again, these trumpet sounds get louder and louder, this, this crescendo of, of a moment with God. And so Moses is even speaking to God, and it says that God answered him in thunder. So it wasn't one of these moments where like, oh man, I, I think... I think God might have spoken to us today at Mount Sinai. No, it, was, it was obvious, like God spoke to them in thunder and lightning, even, and, it, and it, was, it was radically clear. But the, this message, or this moment at Mount Sinai, it sent a clear message to God's people. It was very clear. It was, that the, presence of, it was the presence of God himself there at Mount Sinai, and the message was clear, do not approach me. Do not approach God. God is perfectly holy, and you are not worthy of his presence. So don't even get close to Mount Sinai. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. It was very, very important for God's people to know that there was a difference between him and them, right? And that difference is that he is holy, and his people are not even Moses, even the one who, who interceded for God's people there and went up on that mountain, he was trembling with fear, it says. Imagine how cautious, after that hectic moment, imagine how cautiously Moses must have uh, ascended that hill to go interact with God and receive the Ten Commandments, to receive the law then. So that's what this mountain represents. The mountain that we have not come to is Mount Sinai. That's the mountain of the law. Now, the law is good, but the purpose of the law is to make it really clear that we are sinners and God is perfect. That's how Paul puts it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says it this way, the, the law is not laid down for the just, uh, but for the, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners for the unholy and profane. In other words, we weren't given the law because we were perfect, right? We wouldn't need the law if we were perfect. Uh, we're, we're given the law because we're not. And so the law, as, as God, God's people try to live up to the law, and as we try to live up to the law morally, it becomes clear in a hurry that we have fallen woefully short of the glory of God. You are not worthy of his presence. That's what the, that's what the law teaches us we are not worthy of his presence that was the purpose of the moment of mount sinai so right now you might be thinking hey i thought this passage was supposed to be a breath of fresh air this is not fresh air this is not feeling good right now where's the fresh air when is that part coming well that's coming next because there is another mountain that we're going to learn about here in this passage and this is the mountain that we have come to let's read about it here in 22 24. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Ah, that's better. <laughs> that sounds better. I like this mountain way better than the last mountain that was talked about, right? It's a breath of fresh air, especially after being reminded as to how unworthy we are to be in God's presence. But at this mountain, we're somehow worthy. What's the difference between these mountains? Well, the, when, when King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. And, and Jerusalem and Zion, those words are, are like synonymous for one another. So this is Mount Zion. You would have thought immediately, that, that is Jerusalem. So when, when King Solomon built the temple, it represented literally the presence of God on this earth. You might see it described in other places in the Bible, like in Isaiah, as the footstool, as God's footstool. So as he is enthroned in heaven, the, the temple in Jerusalem is his footstool. And so when people went there to draw near to God, as we've discussed in this book, they literally thought they were drawing, drawing near to God, physically drawing near to him. But we know from the teaching in this book that the temple is a shadow of that heavenly reality, right? 
Jesus is in the true temple, not made with hands. This is what's being described here at Mount Zion. This is the heavenly Jerusalem, as it said there in verse 22. So Mount Zion, this is where we dwell with God. Our citizenship is there, not at Mount Sinai. And that's how the New Testament authors often teach us. You think of passages like in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so no matter what happens here, no matter what happens here with what we can, we can see, it, it cannot affect our citizenship there. Because we are headed there in Christ no, no matter what. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. It is a certainty. We have faith, and, and that's a conviction of things that are not seen, right? Our faith and assurance comes from what is not seen. And so in, in the book of, of Romans, chapter 8, Paul says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, that is things we can see, right, will be able to separate us uh, from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So since we are in Christ, our citizenship in heaven is perfectly secure. It's as good as ours now. It, our faith in Christ is our title deed. This is ours now in Christ. This is where we belong. So right now, through faith, that is our home. That is our destiny. That is where we will dwell for eternity, face to face with God, no matter what. And we will be perfectly holy there with him. Did you see all the, all the things described at this mountain? How about the angels? The angels that are described there at Mount Zion. Now, when we think of, if we think of angels in Scripture, they're typically messengers. Remember, that's what the, the name angel actually means, a messenger of God, because that's typically what they're doing in Scripture. They're, they're communicating on behalf of God to his people because people can't interact with him directly. He's too holy, and we're too unholy. So that these messengers work to communicate God's truth to them. Other times when we see angels in Scripture, uh, they're guarding uh, like, like the path to Eden. It's guarded by an angel. And so we, we, we see that these angels serve ultimately to keep sinners away from God, like his army. And, and they, they, there's, they, they're in that gap in between us and God. But here at Mount Zion, where we belong, they're not sending any messages. They're not guarding. They're, they're there in festal gathering. Innumerable angels. Like all the angels are there celebrating. They're there to party with us. And we belong with them in celebration, worshiping God. Like this is a joy to see this at this mountain. Like we belong there. We have a place there with them. With the angels and with the firstborn. Did you see the firstborn? Now this could represent all the saints that have gone before us in all, in, in all of, of human history. Every one of God's people have been redeemed by Christ. They, those people are there already awaiting us, but we know that God's people are always described as the firstborn, right? And so these are people who have been given this inheritance just like the firstborn in a family in that culture. The children of God are the firstborn. And Jesus was the firstborn among many, as, it, as we learn in the New Testament. So this, this Mount Zion it even has right God there. This is where we dwell with God. That God is mentioned as the judge of all. And he has judged us holy. Now why would God ever judge us holy? We know we're not holy. We know from the law that he has given us that we are holy. We have, we've fallen short of the glory of God. But we're told here in this description of Mount Zion where we belong, there the spirits of the righteous are made perfect. So we have been justified because of Jesus. And so we have a place there face to face with God in perfect holiness because of Jesus. So this is way different than the scene we saw at Mount Sinai, right? There we're dwelling with God in perfection because we have been made perfect perfect. We've been made perfect because of, of who is there, right? Jesus, the mediator. He is the, he is the new and better Moses 
who mediated that old covenant, who interceded there at Mount Sinai. We have a new and better Moses in Jesus. Moses was just a shadow of what was to come in Christ. At Mount Zion, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. And of course, he has mediated that new covenant through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. The sprinkled blood of Christ, we learn there in that passage in Hebrews, says it speaks better a better word than the blood of Abel. I mean, this is the second time the, that the death of Abel has been mentioned here recently, right? We just read that in the previous chapter. And so, you know, the Abel being the son of Adam, well, you know, when we think of how, how the, the son of Adam died, that death screamed vengeance and justice. Something is wrong here. This isn't right. Abel was doing the right things and he died anyway. But the Son of God, his death, it, it shouts to us way louder than that, right? It shouts to us, us saying that we are forgiven. We are at peace with God, our Creator. And so while the Mount Sinai, is, it represents the law, it, it, it teaches us how, uh, how uh, sinful man is prohibited to be in the presence of God, uh, Mount Sinai, the thought of it, and the, and the theophany that took place there produces fear. The message was clear. Things are not okay between us and God. God is holy. We are not. But, but, but Mount Zion is way different. Mount Zion is a place that we do belong, and it's because of grace. It represents grace. It's the message of the gospel. It's a scene of encouragement where God dwells with his people apart from sin because we've been made righteous, made per perfect. So unlike the unapproachableness of God at Mount Sinai, when we have arrived at Mount Zion where we can draw near to God in confidence because of his son. What a joy. What a breath of fresh air. The difference is Jesus. That's the difference between these two mountains. And so this passage should be a breath of fresh air. Are you breathing in this air? When you think about uh, what we're learning here, have you been breathing in this type of air? A lot of people, they, they, they just are so, we're, we're prone to wander from this message, right? We're prone to not see ourselves in this light. And so I think it's often the case that as we battle sin, as we struggle, as we trip and fall, we begin to feel weak and weary in our sin, and, and it becomes more and more painfully clear that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And we begin to think things like, man, have I, have I exhausted the love of God? Uh, maybe you're worried you've gone too far that God can't seek you out and find you. Maybe you're convinced that God would not let someone like you draw near to him in eternity. You are breathing in the sinful fumes of the world if you're believing that message. That is not true. It's not God's truth. You need to stop and breathe in his gospel truth. Breathe in this gospel air today. You don't get to dwell with God by being good. Isn't that a relief? That's a breath of fresh air right there. You do not get to dwell with God in eternity by being good. We get to dwell with God in eternity based on the merit of Jesus and the merit of Jesus alone. That's where we have arrived in our faith in Christ. That's the mountain we're living at right now. That's the mountain that represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so get back up on your feet, all right? Get back up on your feet. Take a deep breath of this gospel air. Lay aside that sin, and let's get on to where we belong. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the teaching in this amazing book. We thank you for this analogy of these two mountains so that we can know that where, where we have arrived right now as your children uh, through your son and where we are headed. We understand that we are citizens of this heaven, heavenly reality right now and we have something to look forward to. We have reason to, to get up and get a move on and keep, keep getting back up after we fall down because Lord, we know that our citizenship has been secured and the journey is worth it, Lord, and may we live it out all to your glory. And Lord, help us to do this uh, all to your glory alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen.